You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 18, sonnet 17. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not, not just another one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Last week, I mentioned compiling a book. This week, I'm excited to be soliciting feedback with a sample copy that covers the first five sonnets. The book, from conception to publication, will remain free for all patrons, past, present, and future. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and as importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash Fisher King. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnet so much more accessible. And of course, 10 times that dollar will bring you the finished product 10 times faster. Right, let's analyze sonnet 17. Sonnet 17 is one of the more straightforward sonnets, wherein Shakespeare speaks to himself through the verse. It is possible to stretch the intention to the reader as well, but I'm going to focus on the dialogue between Shakespeare and the sonnets. Who will believe my verse in time to come, if it were filled with your most high deserts? Though yet heaven knows it is but as a tomb, which hides your life and shows not half your parts. Deserts is a loaded word, as it incorporates the modern meaning of waterless and barren, as he's referred to his rhyme in previous sonnets, but also the meaning that we now only remember in the phrase just deserts, which is something that is deserved or merited. Other older meanings of merit and recompense tie in with the lending theme established in Sonnet 4, and to leave or abandon, which is still in use today. With all of the above, we can see that the sonnets are filled with barren verse, with the poet's merits, with compensation for his efforts, and with his spirit that has abandoned his biological body. This is the third time we've seen the word tomb, or fourth if we include the word grave, though this is the first time we're seeing it used positively. The sonnet sequences the tomb which secretly contains Shakespeare's spirit. With respect to the numerical play I discussed when analyzing sonnets 11 through 14, Half Your Parts has brought me to take a look at Sonnet 77, the exact middle of the 154 sonnets and what Shakespeare's Sonnets.com calls a climacteric, for which I quote, All the sonnets bearing the climacteric numbers, which are multiples of seven or nine, show evidence of being placed purposively. They usually interrupt a set or sequence which has some unifying theme, as here, where the sequence runs from 76 to 86, apart from the interruptions of the climacteric numbers 77 and 81. The precise significance of the use of these numbers in the sonnets is unknown, although it is clear that the sonnets set at these crucial points were carefully chosen, and that their position is not the result of any accidental placing. I must note that this is the first time I've heard the term purposively, as opposed to purposefully, so I guess I'll consider this bonus material for myself. Sonnet 77 just so happens to be a sonnet that summarizes a lot of the established themes. In brief, the sonnet reflects the aging of the poet, the sonnets marking the time invested in them, the blank pages being imprinted with Shakespeare's mind, mouthed graves, whether the sonnets or the minds of the readers, remembering Shakespeare, Shakespeare's brain children delivered and committed to the wasteful pages, the bard making a new mind acquaintance, of both the sonnet and the reader, and these qualities all enriching the sonnet sequence and profiting Shakespeare with a valuable and enduring legacy. Shows not half your parts is even more interesting, as show, or shoe as it was pronounced then, meant to let be seen, put in sight, and make known, in particular to make available for examination, but also the act of exhibiting a display or spectacle and an appearance put on with the intention to deceive. This last meaning is particularly appropriate when considered within the context of a sonnet that discusses Shakespeare employing deception by downplaying his qualities in order to maintain credulity in ages to come. It must also be noted that the expression shows not half your parts 
is a reference to the blason, the poetic technique of praising a woman by separating her body into its constituent parts for individual praise, as well as the description of a coat of arms or the coat of arms itself, from which the poetic form derives its name. As discussed in the first episode, Basic Background, the coat of arms was of particular significance to Shakespeare, but regarding the poetic technique, this verse functions as both a description of what Shakespeare has reflexively done to himself with the sonnets, while simultaneously making a disparaging remark about this technique which was in popular use in sonnet writing. This might be a good time to mention that there is delicious irony in the fact that Shakespeare's only published work, arguably the most important of all his creations, is in the form of sonnets, which is a poetic form that he continually poked fun of through his plays. Not only were his characters' attempts at writing sonnets pathetic and used for comedic effect, but he would make a point of showing that only women read sonnets, and that they weren't to be taken seriously as an art form. This is, in my opinion, what makes the attached poem A Lover's Complaint so elegant. It's a poem about a woman who has read Shakespeare's sonnets and been convinced that she alone was being addressed as their intended lover, when in fact they are exclusively faithful to their creator while sharing with anyone who would read them their, and I quote, thousand favors, amber, crystal, and beaded jet, folded schedules, many a ring of posied gold and bone, letters sadly penned in blood, with slated silk feet and effectively enswathed and sealed to curious secrecy. If I could write the beauty of your eyes, and in fresh numbers number all your graces, the age to come would say this poet lies, such heavenly touches near touched earthly faces. Graces contrasts with deserts, as they are unmerited favors from God, and divine grace refers us back to the idea of pardon and excuse, which follows the established legal theme. The fresh numbers are the freshly written sonnets. Number all your graces continues the theme of the blason. According to Shakespeare'sSonnets.com, verses were sometimes referred to as numbers because of their musical quality, and the fact that one could count the number of stresses to a line. Poet, in Shakespeare's day, meant both poet as we know it today, as well as singer, in line with the musical theme established since Sonnet 8, which is followed by the word heavenly, which apparently was often used with reference to music of the spheres. The accepted reading of the word ne'er is never, for such heavenly touches never touched earthly faces is clearly the reasonable interpretation. But because the original is written with no punctuation and the spelling is N-E-R-E, -E, ne'er, I suspect that its intention is ambiguous, and that it could also be read as near. That would shift the reading of this quatrain from, If I could capture your beauty and graces in these pages, people would say that I'm lying, and that nothing of the sort existed, to, If I could capture your beauty and graces in these pages, people would say that I'm dead, and that such heavenly touch nearly touched the reader's earthly faces. So should my papers, yellowed with their age, be scorned like old men of less truth than tongue, and your true rights be termed a poet's rage, and stretched meter of an antique song? This quatrain is fairly straightforward in meaning, with the additional meanings invested in words such as tongue and rights not contributing much to the overall sense. Rage, however, was invested with more meaning than what it invokes today. Madness and insanity for a start, but more importantly, spirit and passion from the old French. According to the lengthy note on Shakespeare'sSonnets.com, poet's frenzy was a known thing and equated to the divine inspiration of a seer. From the scans of the original publication that I'm working of, which you can find a link to in this episode's description, the sonnets appear to have either been printed on yellow pages, or they really have yellowed with age. In the first case, then, line 9 would be ironic. In the second, it would be prescient. Stretched meter of an antique song is an intriguing line. Stretched meant extended, or lengthened by force, which is clear in this instance, but less obviously referred to being laid out for burial and exaggerated beyond proper limits. The capitalized antique seems straightforward in meaning, but as it turns out was pronounced differently from the French until the turn of the 18th century. 
and in Shakespeare's day would have been read as antic, which added the meanings of grotesque and bizarre, and when referring to art, fantastical figures incongruously combined. All of this presents a complex and powerful range of images that tie into the established themes. But were some child of yours alive that time, you should live twice in it and in my rhyme. In addition to agreement in terminal sounds and poetic rhythm, the word rhyme in Middle English was still used to mean to reason and to count, as in rhyme or reason, which was a leftover from the Old English where the word rim or rhyme, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, meant number. If Shakespeare had a living child, he would continue to live through them. But after the death of Hamnet, the longest he could hope for this to be the case would be until his last child had died, with no further continuation of his name. Even without children, however, he will continue to live on in the sonnet sequence, in its reasoned arguments and reflections, in its auditing and accounting of the bard's spirit and legacy, and in the breath the reader lends to the words on these yellowed pages. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say, say I'm not, not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender, what if I say I will never surrender?